Why does your tap water sometimes try to perform magic tricks? You know, like when it turns cloudy and then poof! Clear as day? It's a little game of hide and seek it plays with teeny tiny air bubbles. Don't worry, they'll rise to the top and fade away without causing any damage, even if you drink the water too soon. When water travels up your pipes with too much pressure, it needs to release some of that gas. Next time you see cloudy water, tell it to take a deep breath and let it all out. If it looks like your tap water has a reddish color, it can be caused by iron, a natural component of drinking water. This can give the liquid a rusty reddish brown color, or it can sometimes even turn yellow. If the water appears more black than red, it could be a combination of iron and manganese. While these metals can cause stains on laundry, they generally should not be harmful to your health. These particles may also be the reason why your porcelain sink gets brown stains too. It's similar to the rust we see on metal surfaces. It may be because the water source comes from groundwater that passes through rocks with iron-rich minerals. Ever wondered why it takes a little longer to rinse the soap off your hands sometimes? Well, it might be due to whether your water is hard or soft. Soft water has less calcium and magnesium ions, while hard water has more. When you're using hard water, the minerals can react with the soap and create some residue that sticks to your hands. Don't worry though, this can easily be rinsed off with a bit more water. If you're used to hard water, washing your hands in soft water may feel a bit different because the soap lathers up more easily and less soap is needed. If you're stuck with a hard water issue, you could consider using a water softener to help with this problem. Sometimes you might also notice some white flakes in your drinking water, but don't worry, they're actually quite common and have a simple explanation. It's hard water again. It's nutrient dense and contains high amounts of minerals like magnesium and calcium. Go ahead and enjoy that tap water. It's still safe to drink. Let's move on to some weird tap water smells, which you might need to watch out for as some can indicate more serious issues. Have you noticed an earthy or rotten egg smell coming from your water? This one is actually a pretty common issue caused by natural organic compounds or minerals in certain areas. While these odors might be unpleasant, they're not usually harmful to our health. Still, it's always good to be cautious and have your water tested by a certified laboratory just to be sure. Have you sniffed your glass and suddenly felt the stench of chlorine or bleach? No need to worry. This can happen, especially during certain times of the year when water treatment plants add more chlorine to keep the pipes clean. The good news is there's a solution. Consider investing in a home water refiner, which not only softens your water, but also removes that pesky chlorine odor. Your hair and laundry will also thank you, and you'll no longer have to deal with unpleasant water smells. Tap water can sometimes have a metallic smell too, and this one is equally as common. Most of the time, it's caused by a slightly acidic pH level. Installing a good drinking water filter can help here too. It will remove those metals and keep your water clean. You can also consider getting a water softener to balance the pH level and protect your pipes. Some people have experienced tap water that smells like dirt or fish. It's not uncommon for the water to pick up odors from different sources, like algae or fungi, depending on the areas it had to travel through to reach your glass. If you have well water, you may have noticed an earthy or musty smell too, and the water can even leave a slimy residue. You'll have to call in a professional to check your well water storage or install a well water filter to remove any impurities. In case you notice that your tap water smells a bit like gasoline, you might need to act fast as this can be something serious. Promptly give your local health or utilities department a call to get to the bottom of the issue. It could be something like a nearby landfill or factory contaminating your water supply, or even a fuel storage tank problem. Tap water doesn't just come out of the ground that way, you know. Most public drinking water systems use different treatment methods to provide safe options for their communities. These systems often use a series of steps, including coagulation, flocculation, sedimentation, filtration, and disinfection. 
During coagulation, chemicals with a positive charge are added to the water to neutralize dirt and other particles. Then, during flocculation, the water is gently mixed to form larger particles called flocks. These flocks settle to the bottom during sedimentation, and the clear water on top is filtered through different materials to remove the dissolved particles and germs. Water treatment plants may also use additional disinfectants to remove any remaining parasites, bacteria, or viruses. Don't worry. Water treatment plants make sure that the water has low levels of disinfectants when it leaves the plant so that it's safe to drink. The water used to quench the thirst of so many communities in the world is either surface water or groundwater. The first one collects on the ground or in a body of water that's visible, like a street, river, lake, reservoir, or ocean. Groundwater, on the other hand, is found under the surface of the earth, between rocks and soil. Some believe that groundwater is always clean because the soil acts as a natural water purifier. Well, that's mostly a myth. While the big particles are filtered out, there are many other elements that can contaminate groundwater, and we definitely don't want those in our drinking water. Some of these elements are naturally occurring, while others are introduced by human activities, like farming or waste disposal. It's always a good idea to have your well water tested for contaminants to ensure it's safe to drink. There are a lot of people that think tap water is a big no-no when it comes to their hydration needs. They choose to always go with bottled water. But bottled water simply means that the liquid has been packaged in sealed containers for drinking. It can come from various sources like springs, aquifers, icebergs, or even municipal tap water supplies. It's important to know that the primary difference between these two types of water is how they're delivered, not their source or quality, which can vary widely for both. Neither is inherently safer or healthier, though tap water is typically cheaper. If cost is not an issue, bottled water has its advantages. It can be more convenient, it has a wide variety of delicious flavors to choose from, and it's often a safe option in areas where tap water is not available. You can try doing your own tap water purifying experiment at home. You'll need some plastic bottles, your purifying materials like sand, cotton, coffee filters, or cleaning sponges, and some small jars. Cut the bottoms of the plastic bottles and punch a hole through each lid. If you have bottles with pop-top lids, you can skip this last step. Then, place the bottles with the lids facing down in each jar. Put each of the filters you've chosen in its designated bottle. For filtering purposes, use water mixed with soil. Make sure to give it a powerful stir before pouring the water into each bottle. Also make sure to measure the quantity of water with a measuring cup. You'll want to filter the same amount of water in each bottle if you want to have relevant results. The best filter should be visible to the unaided eye. Remember, however, that this water wouldn't be safe to drink. Your plants might love it, though. When we look at our planet from space, one color dominates. That's why Earth is called the blue planet. About three quarters of our world is covered with water. But there's a catch. 96.5% of this water is trapped in the oceans. And if you remember the first time your parents took you to the seaside, drinking that water is a big no-no. So, why is ocean water salty and undrinkable? There are two main reasons. The first is runoff water from the land. Rainwater is slightly acidic. Its pH factor is somewhere between 5 and 5.5. Five and For comparison, pure water has a pH factor of 7 and the acid we find in batteries is a bit more than zero. Such rain erodes rocks when it falls on the ground. This releases ions, such as sodium and chloride. They end up in rivers and streams that eventually empty into the ocean. Living organisms remove some of the good ions, but the rest remains. Over time, this increases their concentration in the water. Oceans have their own salt powerhouse. Vents in the sea floor let out a hydrothermal fluid. Sounds complicated but it's easy to understand. Water seeps down the gaps on the ocean floor. Then, the magma from the Earth's core heats up the water. There is a chemical reaction that frees seawater from oxygen. It picks up metals, such as iron and zinc. 
the vents on the sea floor release this metallic water back into the ocean. During an underwater volcanic eruption, the process speeds up. Salt and other minerals are directly released into Earth's oceans. Over time, salt accumulates on the seafloor and forms domes. These deposits occur under dry land as well. Some places on the globe have a large number of salt domes. The Gulf of Mexico is just one example. Beneath the waves, they affect the salinity of water. Other factors that determine how salty a body of water is include evaporation, air temperature, and precipitation. The general rule is that salinity is low near the equator and at the poles. All the oceans and seas in between are likely to have high salinity. Scientists estimate that dissolved salts make up 3.5% of the weight of the world's seawater. The waters that empty into the ocean, such as lakes and rivers, are fresh water. So, why is the seawater salty? To answer this question, we must travel into our planet's past. Researchers believe that primeval seas weren't as salty as they are today. But over time, rainfall washed away the rocks on land, transporting vast amounts of salt into the oceans. The process has been going on for more than 3.8 billion years. Today, some 4 billion tons of dissolved salts end up in Earth's oceans every year. The input and output of salt are fairly balanced. This means that seawater's salinity is stable. So, why can't we drink seawater? We already take salt into our bodies with food and drinks. It is called dietary salt. The World Health Organization recommends that humans consume no more than a teaspoon per person, per day. You shouldn't go over that amount if you want to keep your heart healthy. Centuries ago, salted beef and pork were the standard diet of seafarers. Meat was preserved using salt. At sea, fresh fruit and vegetables would go bad after just a couple of weeks. Before refrigeration, this was the only way to keep food fresh. Pickling was another option for storing food. The reason why we can't drink seawater is the salt content. The percentage of this mineral in our blood is nearly four times lower than the percentage of salt in seawater. Our body simply cannot process such a high amount of the substance. When we intake salt as part of our diet, we also drink liquids. When you serve pretzels, you probably have a glass of water or juice nearby. It helps quench the thirst and keep the salt levels in check. If we drink water straight from the ocean, the exact opposite happens. We just become thirstier. Our body absorbs both water and salt. They end up in our bloodstream. The organs responsible for getting all this salt out of our blood are the kidneys. But they need water to perform their duty. The higher the salt content, the more water they need to wash it away. When the process repeats itself several times over, you become dehydrated. This is the process of losing water from the body. And there's another catch. You start releasing more water than you take in when you drink seawater. The difference leaves you thirstier than you were when you started drinking seawater. Not a good idea to begin with. But some marine mammals, such as whales, seals, and even seagulls can drink water from the sea, just like we drink tap water. The kidneys of these mammals are super efficient. Birds have special glands in their beaks that prevent salt from getting inside their bloodstream. Scientists found that the only land animal that can drink seawater is the camel. And if you ever wondered if fish drank seawater, they do. The gills and kidneys help them pump out the excess salt. For humans to drink ocean water, it first needs to go through desalinization. This is the process of removing salt from seawater, and there's a lot of it to take away. Estimates show that if we laid out all the sea salt across Earth's landmass, it would be higher than the Statue of Liberty. That's why desalinization on a global scale isn't realistic. Right now, less than half a percent of the drinking water we produce comes from seawater. And the demand for potable water is only going to increase. The current rate of consumption means that the demand for fresh water doubles every 20 years. The biggest issue with desalinization is the energy cost. It takes 10 times more energy than other water production methods. And the carbon footprint is huge. Large desalinization plants often need to have their own power stations. This is all because of the technology behind the process. Salt dissolves easily in water. It creates a strong chemical bond with water that is hard to break. Desalinization facilities mostly use reverse osmosis to achieve this. Large pumps exert pressure on seawater to push it through a filter, 
Its membrane is so fine that each pore is a fraction of the size of a human hair. The filter allows for water molecules to pass. Larger salt molecules remain trapped in the membrane. For every quarter of a gallon of fresh water the plant generates through desalinization, there is the same amount of water that is now twice as salty. Hardly the ideal method of water purification. The idea that humans could drink seawater isn't new. In the mid-4th century BCE, the famous Greek philosopher Aristotle considered using a series of filters to remove salt from water. Ships in the 16th century had small, portable distilleries that could boil seawater. This was merely patchwork since exposing seawater to high temperatures doesn't make it drinkable. Such thermal processing only sterilizes the water. You would need to catch the steam that evaporates and wait for it to cool down before it's safe to drink. This is a complex and time-consuming method that is probably not worth the effort. Let us imagine for a second that we got rid of all the salt from the Earth's oceans. We would get an endless supply of drinking water. But at what cost? There are millions of animal and plant species that are adapted to salt water. These include plankton, the basis of all marine life. They wouldn't have enough time to adapt to the new conditions. Not all fish are like the salmon, which thrives both in fresh and salt water. The sudden switch would also have a profound effect on our planet. Since fresh water is less dense, it would immediately cause the ice cap in the Arctic to sink by four inches. This would trigger the largest tidal wave the planet has ever seen. Although the idea of desalinization on a global scale sounds good on paper, we should take it with a grain of salt. Are you a pro swimmer? Brave enough to take a dip in any ocean or sea? Bad news. There are some places you should avoid no matter how well you swim or dive. Some of these places have dangerous underwater rocks, strong currents and tides. Others are famous for legends about monsters and mysterious creatures. So let's dive into this aquatic horror show. Have you ever heard the word the strid? It's a variation of the word the stride that is used in Yorkshire. And it refers to a narrow section of the river wharf that's so small you could jump over it. But don't be fooled by its size, it's one of the most dangerous spots around. Even taking a step into the water can have dire consequences. The river wharf has a forceful current, and since the strid is so narrow, it's even stronger in that area. The intense water flow has eroded the limestone around the strid, which created hollow spaces much deeper than the rest of the riverbed. Here's the secret. The current has also weakened the banks of the strid from below. So, the ground you're standing on, admiring the rapid flow, is probably just a fragile ledge hanging over treacherous waters. There's no record of anyone who found themselves in the water of the strid and found their way out of it. And the worst part? You wouldn't even guess that this innocent looking stream could be such a danger. So, my advice to you, my friend, is to stick to a safer body of water for your aquatic adventures. If you're looking for a weekend getaway in California, Horseshoe Lake is the spot for you. It's got everything. Sandy beaches, hiking trails, and picnic areas, but wait, there's more to it than meets the eye. This lake has a dark side, namely around 100 acres of dead trees that surround it. And it's not just the trees that have been claimed by this lake. The earthquakes that hit in 1989 and 1990 unleashed carbon dioxide from under the hot magma. The gas seeped out into the air, damaging all the life around the lake. Even now, Horseshoe Lake is just as dangerous as it was 30 years ago. What makes it so scary is that the levels of this toxic gas change randomly. Warning signs that are posted everywhere certainly could give a horror film touch to a fun hike in the woods. In Kauai, Hawaii, there's a group of stunning waterfalls that used to be a popular destination for tourists. Kipu Falls, as they're called, were once the go-to spot for swimming and diving. To get to them, you had to take a long walk along a dirt path until you finally arrived at a breathtaking view of a 20-foot waterfall pouring into a crystal clear pool below. But since 2011, this area has been off limits to the public. Why, you ask? Well, there have been a lot of accidents at Kipu Falls. Obviously, jumping off the top of the waterfall would be an obvious reason for that. But in addition, there were much more mysterious cases. Witnesses tell tales of swimmers peacefully enjoying the pool at the bottom of the falls, only to be suddenly dragged under the surface. 
no definite explanation was found to these accidents. The locals believe that the water spirit Mo'o is to blame because it doesn't appreciate being disturbed by loud tourists. There's also a theory of a powerful whirlpool at the bottom of the pool. In any case, guide publishers do not mention Kipu Falls anymore, and trespassing is severely punished. The Samizan Hole, located in the Gulf of Thailand, is the ultimate spot for thrill-seeking divers, but it's also the most dangerous one. With a drop of 280 feet, it's the deepest diving site in the region. But its depth is not the only reason it is considered a place to avoid. The area is a major shipping zone for giant oil tankers. The strong currents around the hole make diving even more treacherous. And if that's not enough, the Samisan Hole is also home to deadly barracudas that could easily attack unsuspecting divers. The water is so murky that visibility is nearly zero, making it challenging to spot these aggressive sea creatures. All in all, the Samisan Hole is a breathtaking but extremely hazardous spot that should only be explored by experienced divers with nerves of steel. Let me tell you about New Smyrna Beach, the shark attack capital of the world. If you're looking for a relaxing vacation spot in Volusia County, Florida, you may want to reconsider this beach. The waters around New Smyrna Beach are teeming with fish, which attracts a lot of sharks. In fact, there have been so many shark attacks reported in this area that it's earned the title of the shark attack capital of the world. Even scientists have warned that if you go for a swim there, you're bound to get up close and personal with at least one of these creatures. We are talking about a distance of 10 feet, and in many cases you wouldn't even notice it. To make matters worse, the bull shark, one of the most dangerous and aggressive types of sharks, has been spotted in these waters. Once again, Kauai is on our list. The beach on Nepali coast called Hanakapiai Beach might look like heaven on earth, but don't be fooled. To get there, you have to trek through a super steep, rocky two-mile trail. There are no lifeguards on this remote beach, so even if you decide to take a dip in the water, you're on your own. The biggest threat to your safety is the incredibly strong rip currents. They are almost always present because there are no reefs to shield the shore. And if someone gets caught in one, there's no safe place to swim to for miles. The nearest safe beach is six miles away. Trust me, this beach doesn't have the best track record in terms of safety. So it's highly advised that you stay out of the water if you end up at this beach. Let me tell you about a place that looks like it's straight out of a horror movie. We're talking about Berkeley Pit, which is an artificial lake situated in Butte, Montana. The first thing you'll notice about this place is that it has an eerie blood-red color that can only be described as unsettling. You might be tempted to take a dip, but that would be a grave mistake. Don't even touch it. The water is extremely dangerous due to the heavy metals present in it, such as cadmium, arsenic, zinc, lead, and copper. They come from the rocks that surround the lake and make the water super acidic. In fact, this place used to be an open pit copper mine, hence its color. So if you want my advice, avoid this place like the plague. There are three lakes in Africa that maybe are the most dangerous places of all that I have mentioned so far. They're all located in Africa. Lake Monoon and Lake Nyos in Cameroon and Lake Kivu in Rwanda are all like ticking timers ready to go off. They were formed over underground pools of molten rock and sometimes this molten rock releases toxic gases like methane and carbon dioxide right into the water. When this happens, the gases can build up until they suddenly burst out of the water, creating massive waves that can wipe out everything in their path. This type of outburst is called a limnic eruption, and it can release a cloud of poisonous gas that can be harmful to everything in the vicinity. The most terrifying part? These explosions can happen at any moment with no warning. So if you ever find yourself near one of these lakes, you'd better be on high alert, because you never know when the next accident might happen. Maybe you know other places you wouldn't recommend for a fun swim? Share your anti-recommendations in the comments below.
Hmm. On the outside, the surface of this lake looks like the aftermath of a disaster. Empty tree trunks spike out of the turquoise waters. The lake is surrounded by mountains, making it a quiet but unsettling place. But those who dare to swim under these dangerous waters will soon discover a whole new world. This isn't the beginning of a fairy tale. It's the actual story of Kayindi Lake, located in Sati, Kazakhstan. Back in 1911, an earthquake caused a major landslide in this location. The valley created eventually filled up with rainwater, practically submerging the forest. The trees that are located above the waters might look very sad, but beneath the surface, they remind you of an underwater forest. Since the waters are crystal clear most of the time, you can still see this fascinating view even from its shores. The ice-cold water makes this lake so tricky and, at times, even dangerous. And don't forget about all the algae, plants, and submerged trees that can rapidly become risky obstacles. Hey, I enjoy a steamy hot bath, but this boiling lake I'll tell you about now is really the stuff of scary dreams. It's located on the Caribbean island of Dominica, and its waters have temperatures between 180 and 197 degrees Fahrenheit. And that's just around the edges, since no one has ever dared to reach the middle of the lake to measure its core temperature. It's true that the heat can go down from time to time, but you never know when these waters may start to boil again. The place is also dangerous because of the gases it releases, such as carbon dioxide. It doesn't smell nice, trust me, but that's mostly because of the sulfur stuck in the steamy air. This seemingly calm lake also carries a dangerous surprise. Lake Manan, located in West Province, Cameroon, it's one of the few erupting lakes on the whole planet, similar to a volcano. And most of the time, it does so without any warnings. Its last eruption dates back to 1894, when it caused serious damage. The chemical mechanism of such lakes works like a can of soda that you shake before opening. There are risky gases on the bottom of the waters, so any disturbance on the surface may trigger their eruption. Natron Lake in Tanzania may be beautiful to watch because of its unique reddish coloring, but it's definitely not a place you'd want to take a swim in. While the water is extremely salty, it also combines with algae, which, by the way, are responsible for the coloring. And that's not even the riskiest thing about it. Natron Lake has pH levels so high that they become corrosive. If you dampen a piece of dyed material in this lake, it'll soon be stripped of its color. These high levels of acidity can also cause serious problems to the human skin. It's not all bad for some creatures, as Lake Natron is the only home to over 2.5 million small flamingos. These acidic and brackish waters support their survival, so it's no wonder they like to stick around. Lake Nicaragua's danger factor has less to do with chemistry and more to do with its inhabitants. It's located on the border of Costa Rica and Nicaragua and is the largest freshwater lake in Central America. When you first look at it, you won't think it can be dangerous. But because of the bull sharks inhabiting it, I wouldn't recommend taking a swim. Sharks tend to be unpredictable and at times intimidating creatures. Plus, they will eat everything if needed. Scientists initially believed this species of shark was only found in this lake. But they soon discovered that people had seen the same sharks in the Caribbean Sea. These astonishing creatures not only cross a distance of over 120 miles to get here, but can also adapt to freshwater, something not all fish can do. Belize's Great Blue Hole may seem alluring to divers. I mean, it has a gorgeous deep blue color and is pretty close to the mainland, about 62 miles. The problem is that beneath the surface of these tranquil waters is a mixed-up series of tunnels which contain many types of coral and other wildlife. These caves are what makes diving through the Great Blue Hole tricky. More so, specialists discover that deeper into the waters, there are fewer and fewer creatures. Why? Because of a hidden layer of hydrogen sulfide that spans over the whole width of the sinkhole. Since there's no oxygen, no creature can ever survive this deep into the hole. Lake Lanier is the largest lake in the state of Georgia. It has a lot of visitors each year, about 11 million, so that's about the same number as visiting the Louvre Museum in Paris. Despite its popularity, a lot of accidents happen on this lake, and nobody knows for sure why. 
One of the explanations may lie beneath the surface of this mysterious lake. There's a lot of debris and rubble in there, along with random objects that have been tossed in, like boats, lawn chairs, and even fishing wire. All this creates a tricky underwater obstacle course. With the added low visibility on the surface of the lake, this place can become risky to navigate. Another one of those lakes that looks like someone might have overdone with editing is the Grand Prismatic Spring, located in Yellowstone National Park, which stretches into the states of Wyoming, Montana, and Idaho. Swimming here is completely prohibited. Why? It's 189 degrees Fahrenheit in the center, almost close to boiling temperatures, and the outermost ring reaches around 131, hence the colors. Since the center of the water is way too hot for any life to make it, there's nothing clouding the surface. The lack of any living organisms here creates that vivid blue that looks almost painted over. On the small Mediterranean island of Cyprus, there's not a lot of rain during the summer. That's why some bodies of water here become so dry that in certain areas, they get covered in a layer of baked salt. It's the case for the Larnaca Salt Lake. Now, don't be fooled by the eerie landscape. These lands can easily become a trap. That's because it's easy to get confused about what's actually a dry surface and what's just a thin layer of salt on top of water or mud. More so, underneath the crust are salt crystals, which can cause problems for people's skin. Samisen Hole is one of the most dangerous places to swim in the whole of Thailand. It's because it's very deep, reaching 280 feet, and gets extremely dark. At certain points, as divers get lower, they can even reach places with zero visibility. No wonder a lot of people get confused and can't seem to find their way up anymore. The largest lake in Africa, and the third largest lake in the entire world, is called Lake Victoria. Not all of its waters are unsafe for people, but some regions can rapidly cause problems. Why? Particularly because it has its own isolated weather system, and that makes the weather really unreliable. It can go from bright and sunny to terrible in a matter of seconds. I mean, who would want to get caught swimming in the middle of a storm, right? Pustoyi Lake is located in Siberia, so I'm guessing I don't need to tell you the waters here get extremely cold. But if you look at the lake, there's nothing out of the ordinary with these waters. Hmm, is that completely true? Eh, most likely not. And people tend to avoid swimming here at all costs, even if they can resist the freezing cold waters. So, what makes Lake Pustovi so mysterious and dangerous? Well, nothing seems to want to live here, and scientists have yet to discover why. They tried to fill the lake with many types of fish and various plant species to see if they could survive in the waters, but the results were hmm, disappointing. Since we don't know exactly what makes it so difficult to survive here, don't go running for your swimming trunks just yet. It's best if you stay away. Hey, you don't have to tell me twice. So, you're getting ready for your adventure in the land of ice and fire. But before you switch your phone to Volcano Explorer mode, hear me out. You need to pack properly to get the most out of your trip. Now, never underestimate the Icelandic weather. It doesn't matter if you're going there in May or January, you can expect all seasons in one trip or even one day. If you're going in summer, pack both light and warmer layers and some good hiking boots. You'll definitely need a waterproof and windproof outer layer. Don't be shy to bring an insulated winter jacket. It's always better to take them off than not have it and freeze. One more thing you need to know about the Icelandic summer is that between June 15th and June 30th, you can expect something known as the midnight sun. The sun doesn't set until after midnight, and even then, it barely goes below the horizon. So it looks more like the evening twilight. Unless your accommodation has extra dark and thick curtains, you might have trouble sleeping when it's so light outside. That's why it's a good idea to pack a sleeping mask. And for the daytime, you'll definitely need sunglasses and sunscreen. Or you could just pop by in December when it's only light for 4 hours and 7 minutes a day. Winter temperatures aren't as terrible as you might think, but the snow and wind coming from all directions make things worse. So focus on staying warm and dry. An insulated jacket, another warm layer or two, thermal pants, reflective waterproof pants to stay dry and noticeable in the snows, 
a good warm hat, oh, and sturdy boots will literally take you a long way. Ice cleats as an add-on will help you stay stable on icy terrains. Spring and fall are pretty short, just like my dad, and the weather is also super unpredictable. So the same set of items you'd pack for winter will do. Even if you're going to Iceland in the coldest weather, definitely pack a swimsuit. Iceland Sea isn't the warmest in the world, but you'll need that swimsuit for outdoor pools and hot springs the country is full of. Since all the pools are heated with geothermal energy, they're always warm. The locals and tourists swim in all sorts of weather conditions. Yes, even in the snow. The Blue Lagoon is the most famous geothermal spa. It uses seawater coming from around 6,500 feet underground, and it comes with useful earth minerals. Once it gets heated up by a nearby geothermal plant, a mix of ocean and fresh water pours into a lava pool at a temperature of around 102 degrees Fahrenheit. It gets its postcard-worthy turquoise color from the silica in it, reflecting sunlight. Definitely bring a reusable water bottle for the trip. You can refill it with tap water since it's perfectly safe and healthy. The country is full of pure springs and glaciers, and that high-quality water goes to every tap. There are zero chemicals in it, so it's officially some of the clearest kinds of water in the world. All you have to do is wait a bit when you change from hot to cold water. Hot water also comes to Icelandic homes straight from the spring and is heated by geothermal sources. The sulfur in it makes it smell like rotten eggs. Although it's yucky, it's totally harmless. Bottled water is overpriced and it literally comes from the same tap. Icelanders will have no problem speaking and understanding English. But if you want to feel more like a local, you could bring translation earbuds. Icelandic is pretty difficult to grasp on the go and might sound unusual. The language has less than half a million native speakers, but they're super proud of it, and it keeps growing. Instead of borrowing words from other languages for new concepts, they create new words or repurpose some old ones. The Icelandic for computer, for instance, totally translates as the number oracle. There are over 130 ways of saying wind, and 112 of them are written on a wooden walkway from the calmest to the strongest wind, just in case you want to learn them. There are also some concepts the English language just doesn't have. For example, this. Window weather. It's the kind of weather that looks good from the inside, but once you step out, you regret your decision. Makes sense to me. In case, for some reason, you were planning to bring a horse to Iceland, stop right there. The Icelandic horse is one of the oldest and purebred horses in the world, with a history of the breed going back to the 10th century. The story goes that the ancestors of today's beauties were carefully selected to be brought to Iceland from Norway during the Viking years. And no one has imported any other horse breeds to Iceland since the 11th century. It is banned by law. This complete isolation helps the Icelandic horses stay super healthy and live a long life. These beauties used to be the only form of transportation in the country. They've adapted to survive in all kinds of weather conditions and have grown, although they still don't look huge. And oh, when you see it, never call it a pony. It can offend the locals. Now, I don't want to be the one to tell you, but your wish won't come true just because you threw a coin in one of Iceland's thermal springs. The signs forbidding throwing coins are all over the place for a good reason. The coins keep hanging in crystal clear waters, ruining the natural look of geysers and pools. Plus, researchers have proved that coins and other trash can change the color of the thermal water for good. That's precisely what happened in Yellowstone. The Morning Glory pool changed its color from tropical blue to green with orange and yellow hues. If you don't want that to happen to the beautiful Icelandic landscapes, then keep the coins for souvenirs or in your pocket. Now, elves are a big deal in Iceland. About half of the population believes in their existence. The local folklore sees elves as the hidden people who live in the lava fields. When someone wants to build something in one of those, they have to take into account the elves' opinions. Yes, these guys have a spokesperson who comes to meetings. Sometimes road construction is even diverted around boulders where the elves live so not to disturb them. These little guys go house hunting during the winter holiday season. And it is 13 elves called the Yule Lads who bring the young generation of Icelanders their gifts. 
If you want to learn more about the elves during your trip, you can sign up for Reykjavik's Elf School. You'll get textbooks, a legit elf diploma, and tea with cookies as a bonus. They might seem like a regular photo prop, but these little pyramids of rocks actually have a name and history. The humans of the past used to build cairns to be used as kind of a GPS system long before the concepts of cars and GPS was even created. Travelers marked certain spots along their routes to help other wanderers find a path. They used to be the only way of marking the routes, and you can still find them all over the island. Iceland, of course, has GPS now, but it's illegal to move rocks from the cairns because they're considered an important part of history. Plus, some hikers still use those pyramids for navigation. So, if you randomly build one of those, hikers can easily get lost as they'd follow the wrong route. Oops! Now, if you want to bring a good gift to your new Icelandic friends, a book is a great idea. For many years, the country had the highest rate of publishing books per capita in the world. On average, 1 out of 10 Icelanders publishes a book in their lifetime. There's even a special book-giving holiday. Icelandic sagas go back to the 13th century. Writers create their sagas even on napkins and coffee cups. Each geyser and waterfall has its own tale about heroes and heroines attached to it. You can also scan barcodes on public benches to listen to audiobooks on your smartphone. Cool!